Good morning. My name is Don Vivret. This is It's Your Money, week two. I'm going to be talking about annuities, mutual funds, and other things in terms of, of the financial sector. Uh, I want to introduce Pete Coate. He wants to do a bit of an introduction, and then we'll talk about the charity that's here today, which is the Newport Library Foundation. And so, Pete, Recording in go for it. Hello, Don. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, we, the participants are just kind of starting to come online. So we're gonna give it a, maybe about a 30 seconds to a minute. And my clock said it just turned 10 a.m. So this is our um, second session of the It's Your Money series. Uh, for those who are attending the very first time, financial and estate literacy is a 501c3 organization. We're a charity as well, and our mission is to educate individuals uh, regarding money, estate planning, and charitable planning. And we encourage, our only real bias is that uh, we encourage people to give because giving is good for you. But before you can give, you got to have a little understanding about money and how it works and what are, what's deductible and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we are sponsored by charitable organizations. Jerry, could you go ahead and come online? And there you are. Good morning, Jerry. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Jerry's the executive director of the Newport Beach Library Foundation. Uh, the Library Foundation has been a sponsor of the workshop series for approximately, and I forgot to turn off my phone, <laughs> uh, for approximately the last seven or eight years. And the Newport Beach Library and a foundation is probably is one of the more wonderful charitable organizations here in Orange County. Uh, Jerry, why don't you tell us a little bit about the foundation and the library? The first thing to know, uh, as I've just been uh, the CEO of the Library Foundation for just three months, a little over three months, and uh, the foundation and the library has come back fully in person on live uh, uh, here at the library. We're at the Central Library. The library is an amazing organization, the Newport Beach Library. We have a Central Library, three branches, and we serve well over a million people each year. In fact, we serve nearly that much during the pandemic shutdown because the foundation has over the years supported so much of what we consider our e-branch, uh, our digital uh, information. And so it became a way for people to continue to be able to get programming. We continued our programming through the pandemic. We did it virtually online. So we as a foundation really make the difference in making the library a, a great institution that serves not only Newport Beach, but the entire region. We do a number of programs each year, the Witty Lecture Series, Library Live, this program. We do a medicine program, Medicine in Our Backyard, and we run the book discussion group for the library. So it's, in addition, we fund capital projects for the library uh, through our members and our donors. For instance, there is an extensive state-of-the-art media lab here at the Central Library, which the foundation funded. We funded study rooms, we funded all sorts of different aspects of the uh, library to make it something that is really an excellent library, an excellent place of learning, an excellent place of community. Uh, soon we will be uh, mounting a capital campaign uh, to, to uh, fund the construction of a state-of-the-art lecture hall uh, here on the grounds of the library, uh, semi-detached from the building itself. And that will be a really significant aspect for the entire community to have a state-of-the-art 275 seat raked auditorium where everyone can see the stage and there can be 
uh, musical, the, the music halls that the library puts on will be there along, as, along with our uh, lecture programs. It may be two or three years uh, before it is finished, but uh, it will be something that not only this community, but anyone that, that comes to uh, the library will be a, a exceptionally proud of. It will be an architectural masterpiece. So uh, that's what the foundation does. And the foundation, uh, in a very real sense, the Public Library Foundation is very supportive of this uh, program because financial literacy is something that everyone needs. And yet so few of us actually got, we could have gone through college, we could have got a master's degree with all this stuff. And we haven't had the experience or the knowledge of financial literacy. And so, so many times, so many of us are adrift when it comes to so many of these questions, so many of these challenges to be financially solvent and to be able to fulfill your own philanthropic wishes. So this program that we sponsor is really something that is important for the community, important for all of you. So we thank, uh, the organization, and we're glad you're attending, and we hope you come to the library and see them in person. We follow all the COVID protocols, but we are having the, the uh, workshops in person, and while you're here, wander through the library and see the books, see the art, see everything that we have here for you. So thank you, and I turn it over to you to do the meat of the program. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Uh, the library is fantastic, and, and it you know, one of the things in the financial world is to get good information. Well, the library just has the latest uh, Morningstar value line uh, and the computers uh, for you to use. So the information is there. Just got to go use it. And the speaker series is absolutely fantastic. And this lecture hall that, uh, um, that they're building and planning on building is going to just be a, um, a super in the community. Um, our session today, yes. Before, before we move on, um, I'm as the host, as the administrator, whatever the heck I am, um, if you move your mouse so that it wakes up the bottom of your screen, you can see a little thing that says Q&A. If you want to ask us questions while we're going along, please just click on that. Type in your question. We'll either answer them live. I may answer them directly for you. Um, if not, we have a record of what all has been asked and we make sure we follow up along the way with them. So the one thing I'll say is, if you say, what do you think of this particular stock? We're not gonna answer the question. Um, we don't know your particular situation. So all of the conversations we're gonna have are wonderful material, very interesting. Don't go sell anything or buy anything because of what you hear today. Just think about it and think about what it means to you. As Jerry just said, if you don't have financial literacy, this is really scary. Um, so that's what we're here to do. Please use the Q&A button and send over any questions you have and I will work to get those answered along the way. I'm gonna disappear so that Paul can come in and work with Pete, but I'll be the voice of God coming in and asking questions along the way. So that's where we are. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Don. So our session today is going to be it's called annuities and mutual funds. And Paul, uh, why don't you bring up your ask first form so we can introduce you? Absolutely. There it comes. All right. So as we do with all of our presenters, we go through their ask first form to give you um, an idea as to who they are, what their credentials, how they charge, et cetera. Well, first of all, Paul, you've got a master's or other advanced degree. And I see you've got a few credentials. So let's go through them one by one. Uh, <laughs> sure. uh, where did you graduate from school from first? Uh, so my undergrad was local here, Cal State Fullerton, uh, in psychology, and then I got a master's from Creighton University uh, in investment management. Good educational background. What does the CFP mean? Certified financial planner. Um, it's the designation you want for someone that's doing financial planning. And 
And how long did it take you to get your CFP? Um, I've had the CFP now for about nine years and it took a, about a nine month program, um, six yeah. months of studying, another two months of um, getting ready to take the actual exam. Okay, so it wasn't just a by your designation. It actually is a no. job. Correct. Uh, yeah, you have to yeah. a good 200 hours. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, what is CPWA? That is a Certified Private Wealth Advisor. Um, it's a good designation for someone that has the CFP if they want to obtain additional knowledge in advanced estate, tax, and investment planning. Okay. And again, what did you have to do for that particular designation? Uh, so for that designation, um, I had to study for six months. I had to attend a one week in live person course, which was 40 hours of coursework over one week. And then I had to take an exam and pass that exam um, to obtain that designation. And then you have an MS and what does that mean? Uh, that's my master's of science in investment management. That's my master's. And uh, how long did it take you to get that? Uh, that was two years. Wow. So again, those are genuine credentials. You got over 13 years experience. Um, is the 13 years experience in the financial planning world? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I've been doing financial planning that whole time. Okay, great. Um, your uh, uh, relevant licenses. I don't consider the CFP or the CPWA a license per se. <laughs> uh, uh, because it's not Fair state uh, certified, so to speak. But uh, um, but they but those are your numbers, and you can go. Where can you go to look up um, whether or not you've had any problems with your CFP? Um, so it's just CFP.net is the website. Okay. And then um, you can do the broker search there. You can type in my license number or search by name. So uh, your license number, you're referring to your FINRA registration? Um, the CFP actually, each CFP actually has their own number. That's oh, what okay. this number is here. Okay, if but they, we can look you up on FINRA as well. Correct, yeah, on broker check. Okay, yeah. all righty. Um, let's go down to business relationship. You put your client's interest first before your own interest and those of your employer, correct? Correct. Okay. And then uh, how, um, how are you compensated and how do you charge your clients? Uh, excellent question. So we work on a fee only basis. Um, for most of our clients, I'd say 95% plus, that's gonna be a percent of assets under management. Most clients will hire us for two services. One isn't managing their investments. The other one is for financial planning. So most clients will just pay a percent of, investments under management. So for example, if we manage $100,000, the fee is roughly 1%. So that'd be a fee annually of about $1,000, just as an example of how that works. Okay. Um, otherwise, um, they can pay us- Do you have a minimum, us, Paul? Uh, our minimum is 20,000. Okay. Uh, we try and help as many people as we can. Okay. And, uh, uh, and then do you offer any kind of uh, commission products or sell insurance? We do not. Um, I actually used to be licensed for life insurance and we'll get into more why I, I don't have that license anymore. But um, if, if we find out a client has a need for that, we will refer it out, but we don't make any money on that. And, but you, one of the first things you do in somebody's financial plan is the review to make sure that they are appropriately insured. Absolutely. It's always one of the first areas that we cover. Okay. Um, and say, uh, so you're paid by uh, salary by the firm that you work for. Talk a little bit about the firm and um, uh, how many how many clients per advisor. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So the firm itself is called BFSG, also known as Benefit Financial Services Group, but we go by the acronym because the other is a mouthful. Um, we've been in business for over 30 years. We are an RIA, a registered investment advisor. So we have chosen to be a fiduciary at all times for our clients. Um, we have uh, two offices. We have the main office here in Irvine. We have a second location in Phoenix. Uh, currently, we have about 30 employees. Um, we currently manage about a billion dollars uh, for all our clients. 
And the average advisor manages somewhere about 50 to 100 clients. We have uh, about seven different advisors. And then who, who do you use as your custodian? Uh, we use either Schwab or Fidelity. Okay. And then let's see. And then you certify that the above is true and correct. You have your telephone number on there. And do you charge for initial review of somebody's financial affairs? Never. Um, we'll, we will always offer a free initial consultation. There may even be a second call that we wouldn't charge a fee for um, to understand the client's situation and make sure it's a good fit for us or for them or um, just provide uh, good education along the way. And then how, uh, do the clients get charged on a quarterly basis? Yeah, so the fee is broken down quarterly, correct. So, And is there a limit to number of times that they can come in and see you and meet with you and to figure out what's going on in their financial life? If you want to see my smiling face every day, you're more than welcome to. Um, but most clients um, tend to work with us um, quarterly for the first year. Uh, we'll meet with them. Um, well, we meet with them more than that, uh, especially if we're doing like a financial plan and managing their investments. When we first get started, you're going to get tired of seeing us. Um, but after the end of the first year of meeting on a quarterly basis, it's up to the client. Um, some clients like to maintain that quarterly pace. Other clients trust us or don't want to be a little less involved. So they may be like semi-annual. Okay. Let's get into the program. And by the way, this is not there. All there is to know about Paul. You can read about Paul a little bit here. And Paul is a very nice person as well. <laughs> so let's get into the program. Sure. All okay. right. So it's all yours, Paul. All right. So what I'm going to start with talking about who oversees the financial services industry. Um, really, the name that you need to know here is going to be the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission. They are the U.S. government agency that regulates the advisors, the professionals involved, the trading. They're the ones trying to prevent the fraud, manipulation, and deception. Um, aside from that, there is a group called FINRA, which is the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. They are a self-regulatory organization, meaning that it's members that have chosen to join the group and they regulate themselves. Um, but they ultimately report to the SEC, so it's good to know of the FINRA, but really the one that you need to know and pay attention to is the SEC. They're the ones that oversee um, our whole industry. What does uh, um, and FINRA performs one vital function? Um, and talk a little bit about broker check. Yeah, so um, the industry um, is really split into two different models. You have uh, what are called brokers who are going to be licensed individuals. Um, they have a different standard than um, individuals like myself that are fiduciary um, that are on the independent advisor side. Um, and so what SEC has set up is what's called broker check. Uh, just Google broker check uh, is the easiest way to find it. And what it allows you to do is look up any potential financial advisor that you're working with, or if you have an advisor, you can look them up or look their firm up. And that's going to let you know any information um, that would be helpful to you. So have they been convicted of doing fraudulent transactions? Have they done things like front running or other illegal activities to make money uh, in illegal ways? Um, can they manage their own finances? Have they have to file for bankruptcy themselves? Because if you're working with a financial planner, you probably don't want one that can't manage their own finances. Yeah. So whether the where you have a financial planner or a broker, there are good people and bad people. Just check out the individual um, on the uh, FINRA website. Let's go to the oh, next yes. slide. So as part of broker check, um, anyone that is on the broker side um, and what a broker means is they work with um, a brokerage firm. Typically that's gonna be your Merrill Lynch's or the banks are the most common form these days. Um, and they're gonna have investment licenses. So series seven allows them to sell things like stocks, futures, uh, commodities. Um, they're going to have 
63 and the 65 are the most common. Um, so when you hear, if you think of the old days where it was the stockbroker, the person picking up your phone and calling, cold calling people to try and sell them stocks, um, these were the licenses that they held. And there are still a lot of indiv individuals that hold these licenses today. Um, the main one that you want to make sure that they have is the 65 to make sure that they can give investment advice. Um, that is the one that's going to be used for most discretionary accounts where they're, if you're giving someone control to manage their investments, this is the license you're looking for for that. And the good news here as well is, is, is that if you're confused by a license, Google it. Google uh, FINRA Series 7, and it'll tell you everything that you need to know about that Series 7. Um, Paul, do you, you, uh, you don't have a Series 7. Does that mean that you're less qualified? <laughs> Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I actually began my industry, began um, when I first joined the industry, I had these licenses. I had the seven, the 63 and the 65. I worked for Wells Fargo Bank and JP Morgan Bank as a financial advisor slash financial planner um, for the early part of my career. Um, working with clients, trying to do what was in their best interest, um, doing financial plans and things like that. But I did sell uh, a mixture of um, commission-based products like life insurance or annuities. Um, and I also did a lot of uh, managed investment as well. Um, for me, what changed and uh, was in 2013, I was working for JP Morgan. Um, I was relatively new to the firm at that time. I was actually one of the uh, fastest growing new advisors. I was actually the fastest growing advisor in Southern California and on a national sales call. Uh, so this is my boss's boss. This is like every advisor with JP Morgan on this call. He, our uh, senior leader starts reading names. My name is mentioned. So I thought maybe it was going to be, you know, good job for, you know, growing your business. Uh, and in fact, it was the exact opposite. I was actually called out because I hadn't sold enough annuities. Um, I had to sold zero. And so me and, and a handful of other names were read and we were asked point blank why we haven't sold any annuities. Um, it was then and there that I realized that I needed to work for a firm that cared about my client's interests at all times, not what was best for the stockholders. Um, so at that point, I put in my resignation and I switched from that broker model to being an independent advisor. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, let's go, let's skip this one. Sure. And, and the reason for that is, is, is that uh, that was from last year and it was a sample of the invitations that we all receive going to these dinner programs. And what do they try to usually sell at these dinner programs? Life insurance. Yeah, annuities. Or annuities, yeah. Yeah, indexed annuities. So, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. So let's go on. Okay. Um, not all financial advisors are created equal. Um, some certain things that you want to look at if, when you're trying to hire uh, one, or if you have a current advisor, it would be a good time to go back to and, and check with them on these things. Um, the most important one, in my opinion, is you want to work with someone that is a fiduciary at all times. If they hold themselves to the fiduciary standard, that means that they have to do what's in your best interest at all times. Most advisors, especially those under the broker dealer, like we've talked about, they're held to a different standard. It's called suitability or best interest. It just simply means that whatever they recommend to you has to be suitable. So it could be a higher fee or a higher commission product that they sell you because that's gonna make the advisor more money. But as long as it's suitable, then um, they're fine. They're allowed to sell it. So what's the difference, uh, Paul, between a fee only and a fee based individual? That's a great question. Fee based is um, a marketing term used by those that um, sell commission based products to sound like they're um, fee only, but really um, they're going to 
they still sell commission-based products like insurance or annuities um, to try and get additional money. Now, uh, when you look at your, uh, the, uh, the, the slide, you have a certified financial planner we talked about. We talked Correct. about the certified public accountant. We're all familiar with that. What is a chartered financial analyst? Um, this is a, uh, some of the goes through this program is a three-year program. Uh, typically, most people take four to five years to go through the program to specialize in investments. So um, whoever is managing your portfolios, this is a, the ideal designation that you want to have because this is someone that spent three to five years of their life studying all there is to know about the investment industry. So this one is not, this one is not just a license. It is a credential. Correct. So one of the things that's difficult in this industry is to determine what is the difference between a credential uh, and a license. A license is something that the state requires like a driver's license, like a, a fiduciary license. It gives you the minimum qualifications. A credential such as the CFA, the CPA, the, CF, the CFP is that you have to spend a number of years studying for it and passing the exam. It gives Correct. you a little bit more than minimum. Yeah, and, and really there's, in, I think in my industry, last time I checked, there's no less than about 2000 designations. Really? Is that, I thought there was like 150 or something. No, no. There's yeah. More no, than I, that, I, huh? Gosh. Yeah. Really? Well, what happened is you have these um, colleges, you know, the, these for-profit colleges have found that they can make a lot of money making up their own credentials. Ah. So an advisor can literally spend $500 and buy a credential. Um, yeah, so there's Don't a lot careful. of advisors. Go yeah, Google. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of advisors with alphabets too. Yeah. Just look for these three. Yeah. Um, custodian, we talked about, you use Swab and Fidelity. Um, yep. Talk a little bit about confirm. Uh, what do you mean by confirm about individual needs? So every client is different. Every people are at different stages of their lives or have different financial concerns. So we have some clients that are very charitably inclined. So we have an, an advisor here that specializes in charitable giving. So they tend to work with that advisor because that advisor has a the expertise that they're looking for. So whatever it is that's most important to you, you just want to make sure that the advisor is able to meet your needs. So uh, let's a lot say of, if you're a school teacher and they yeah. have a, a whole retirement system that's completely different than most. Yeah, you want someone that's familiar, familiar with campers with and Kelsters. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. If you're a medical doctor or a dentist, you have lots of debt, especially early on in your <laughs> career, and you need to know how to manage all that. And you, yeah, we actually have a, it's funny you mentioned that when we have an advisor that's from the healthcare field yeah. um, that, that works just with doctors. Yeah. So. yeah, so you need to understand when you talk about what services do they offer, do, do, do people come into you and say, hey, I just want that, you to handle my investments or, or do they come in and say, hey, I want to know about my home mortgage. I want to know about my taxes. I want to know about my insurance. Because I think most people think of you just for investments. Yeah, most people think of an investment advisor or financial advisor just as the investment guy. And, and that's about it. Um, when you're working with a, a true financial advisor or ideally a financial planner, um, they should be able to help you with almost any topic that is related to your finances. They may not have all the answers, but hopefully they can point you in the direction of someone who does. So they should be a good starting point. So I've helped clients with things from putting together a business plan to should they buy saddle, or should they buy, uh, what was it, a shrimp farm in the bayou? The client <laughs> wanted to know if they should buy that or not. Well, so you know, we looked at that or helping with, you know, should they buy rental properties? You know, yeah, so exactly. these are all so these sorts of questions that we, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So these are the type of questions we like to try and help clients with. Yeah. Um, ADV, what does that mean? Um, again, the SEC is the uh, over the government oversight. 
Um, it's a form that they have that every firm has to put together. That form ADV gives you all the information about that firm that you would want to know. So how many advisors, what fees do they charge? What are the different fees for? Um, again, has there been any compliance issues with the firm itself or any advisors associated with the firm? All that sort of information is there. So it's just a great way to learn more, um, kind of check under the hood, if you will. Okay, let's go to the next slide. All right. All right. What are annuities? And by the way, annuities, mutual funds are one of the two major products that are sold by the financial services industry. That's why we're starting on these two products, but it's not the only products that are sold by the financial services industry. Sure. Uh, annuities certainly are the ones that have the worst reputation and cause the most problems for advisors like myself. Um, and the reason for that is annuities I, are not- However, I, I do want to interject something. Yeah. Since I do the charitable giving module, I want to make sure we're talking about commercial annuities here, yeah. not charitable <laughs> gift annuities or other kinds of annuities. I just, truth in lending, I want to make sure that we talk about this as a commercial annuities, not charitable. And I'll go back to being quiet. Okay, thank you, Bob. Yeah, and when he says uh, commercial, he means this is an annuity contract that you're buying from an insurance company. So what an annuity is, is it, it's a contract between an individual and an insurance company where the individual is given a lump sum of money. And in return, the insurance company is offering guaranteed payments for life. Annuities were originally developed to be self pensions. Everybody knows what a pension is, right? You work at the company, the company gives you a paycheck throughout retirement. An annuity was created initially um, in its most basic form to be a self pension, a kind of another way to have a paycheck for life. Um, and there the are a lot of good things about an annuity as well. So which- uh, Absolutely. Yeah, when we're gonna talk about those. So it's just not, an annuity is not good or bad. It depends on the individual situation. Yeah, just, yes, correct. Um, it's important to know that most annuities are not regulated by the SEC. They're actually regulated by state rules. So they tend to be less stringent. So their sales and marketing tactics tend to be uh, a little bit Overboard. more in the, gray, in the gray area, I would say. Um, you know, it, for example, um, I, I can, I can, I've seen lots of examples of financial advisors that have been barred from the, by the SEC from the industry. So instead of learning a new line of work, they just sell insurance. So just, the, that's just kind of an example, but anyways, uh, annuities at their most basic form, they're supposed to be giving you some form of income throughout uh, the rest of your life, whether it's you give the money on day one, and then that that same month, that turns into an income stream for life, or you could put money into an annuity, and then that money grows. Uh, with the idea being, sometime later in life, you'll turn on that income stream. Um, with annuities, they are taxed differently, so you don't get the you lose the the qualified dividends tax rate. Um, annuities are taxed at income, so it's going to be taxed whatever your highest income uh, bracket is. And annuities can carry higher fees, and we'll talk about that in just a second. When it comes to annuities, there's really two types. The immediate annuity, this is the old style annuity or the most, you know, the original annuity. You give that money to the bank or to the insurance company, they're going to turn around and turn that into a paycheck for life. Which is the very comfortable, comforting for many individuals that. They don't have to worry about anything. They know they're going to get that amount every month. It's almost like buying a pension plan. Absolutely. And these, um, you know, for a lot of clients, you know, maybe you have sufficient assets and you don't want to have more market exposure, but you want income. These can be one of the best tools out there to do that. Yeah. So absolutely can be a great fit for the right individual. Yes. The deferred annuity, um, these are the more uh, newer types of annuities. There's actually three types of them. We'll get into those in a second. But the idea here is you put your money in now, then that money grows tax deferred. And then at a later point in time, 
you're going to turn that into an income stream. So a, a good example might be maybe you're 55, you're going to start a new job. So you roll over your 401k into an annuity, and then you're going to start using that as an income stream when you plan on retiring at age 65. You that know, that would be a common example. Yeah. The, the, the charitable gift annuity world that, that charities issue also have an immediate annuity and they also have a deferred annuity. We get more into that into the it's your estate section and we, when we talk about charitable uh, planning. But charities also offer both and you get the extra benefit of an income tax deduction. Uh, as compared to a commercial annuity. And the charitable annuity is two pages long. Uh, these <laughs> annuities are a little longer. <laughs> they are. They're a little bit more complex. That's why yeah. the state of California requires a 30-day grace period. So anybody that signs an annuity contract, they can break that contract within 30 days just so that they have the proper time to review all the pages and truly understand what's going on. So when we talk about the types of deferred annuities, um, the original type was called a fixed annuity. Um, this is where, think of it like a CD. You get a guaranteed rate of return for the, for the length of the contract. You know, 10 years ago, you could have gotten a guaranteed rate of return of four or 5%, for example, um, which was great. The challenge in a low interest rate environment like we're currently in is a lot of new contracts are at or under 1%. Yeah. If you have an older annuity contract, man, take a look at that interest rate because I just looked at one uh, yesterday and it's 3.5%. We don't want to get rid of that. We want to no, keep that, it. Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, certainly uh, very important to know. Um, so fixed annuities are great in a high interest rate environment not as good in a low interest rate environment. Uh, the most common annuity, one of the most common annuities sold is called a variable annuity. Uh, the idea with this is you're gonna put the money into the annuity contract. It's gonna be invested in stocks or bonds and it's gonna help, help your money grow faster over time, hopefully. Um, with a variable annuity though, um, you're taking the investment risk, not the insurance company. And here's what I mean by that. That money is invested in stocks or bonds and mutual funds, which we'll talk more about. And if that money grows, great. Your, your cash value grows faster. But if we have a down market, let's say the markets are down 20%, then your value in that annuity goes down by 20%. So you are carrying the investment risk, not the company or not the insurance company with the variable annuity. Um, with an indexed annuity, this was offered as a way to give people the growth potential of a variable annuity without that downside of potentially losing money. So the idea with an index annuity is it's going to be is your return will be linked to a stock market index like the S&P 500. And you're going to make money when the index goes up. There's typically be some sort of cap or a limit. But if the index is negative return for the year, you don't lose money. You just get zero return on your money instead. Paul, so, can you yeah. purchase any of these types of annuities uh, without a commission? You can actually. Um, there are both variable and indexed annuities that can be sold um, with uh, on it. Instead of paying a, so with a commission, you're paying an upfront sales charge that's going directly to the advisor that sold it or the company of the advisor that sold it. Um, there are annuities now that are variable or indexed that can be sold by an advisor that are fee based. So okay. instead of paying an upfront commission, they're just going to be, you know, let's say your advisor charges 1% per year, that annuity just has a 1% per year fee attached to it and the advisor's making the investment decisions. Okay. And then one other question on this is, is that if you purchased an annuity in the last five years or 10 years, uh, is there a way to change out of that annuity into another annuity tax-free? So yes, but it might be difficult. Okay. 
Um, with annuities, um, they do have what's called a surrender penalty. And we'll talk more, we're going to talk more about this. We'll touch on this now. Um, with a uh, surrender penalty, what that says is when you sign that contract is you have to keep that money in that annuity for a period of time. Uh, if you take it out before that time expires, you're going to be paying a penalty um, on that money to get access to that money. Okay. So if you're out of that surrender penalty, there is what's called a 1035 exchange. And that 1035 exchange um, allows you to take the money from an old annuity contract and move it into a new annuity contract without any tax implications. And so if you have an old contract that isn't good, but you want to keep the money in annuities, it's a good way to maybe switch to a, a better product if it makes sense. Yeah. And ideally you're out of the surrender penalty. Yeah. Make sure you're out of the surrender penalty and make sure you go to a fee only advisor so that because if you go back to your insurance agent, uh, the, your best customer is one that already bought, purchased an annuity and you don't want a new annuity, you may want to just exchange it almost like a 1031 exchange. Exactly. On real estate. Let's go to the next slide. Sure. And this is just an example of that, how that surrender fee works. Most annuities these days are about seven years. And this is actually taken from one of my clients' annuities that they recently purchased. Um, so in the first year, if the annuity is 100,000, they decide you know, six months in, they don't want it anymore. That penalty is 8%. So they would pay eight grand to get access to their full money. Now, there, it tends to be a small loophole that most annuities will offer nowadays. Most annuities after the first year will allow you to withdraw 10% of the contract value per year without penalty. So if you have an annuity that's 100,000 after year one, you could take out 10%, which would be 10 grand. Now that annuity is worth 90,000. So the next year you could take out another 10%, so that'd be 9,000. So, to, so just to spread this out, Paul, yeah. should people know how to get out of a product before they get into the product? <laughs> um, any investment, there's two things that you need to know. The first point, it, the first uh, is why are you buying it? Um, and the secondly is what is your exit strategy? Very few investments do we ever hold for the entirety of our lives. Vast majority of investments we're going to exit at some point. Um, I would view an annuity the same way. So I would absolutely agree that it's very important to know what that exit strategy is, whether it's turning that into an income stream or flip, you know, getting out of that annuity at some point. But there should be a financial plan in place, hopefully, that details what the plan is for that annuity long term. You know, um, I had a client the other day that had the FDIC insurance on a CD at a bank. And so she didn't want to... She wanted, she needed the money now, but she didn't want to uh, pay the penalty. And I said, well, why don't we ask the bank what the percentage is and what the actual fee was going to be? And it turned out that the fee was less than $25 on the FDIC <laughs> cashing that uh, CD in early. So recommend highly, don't just think that you're going to be penalized, actually find out what the percentage is and what the actual dollar no number is before you decide to enter that particular investment. Yeah, and it, if you have a good financial planner you work with, um, they should be able to join you on that call to the insurance company, give you all that information in a 10, 15 minute call. Yeah, it's fees is something that you can control. Investment performance, you cannot. Let's go to right. the next slide. Okay, so looking and talking about controlling fees, variable annuities can be very high commissioned products. Um, so when we look at the fees associated with a variable annuity, there's really four kinds that you need to be aware of. There's the actual cost of the insurance for the annuity, that's going to be the mortality and expense ratio. That's typically around one to one and a quarter percent. 
They can have an administration cost of another quarter percent. Sometimes this is included in that uh, mortality and expense ratio. Um, aside from that, your money is invested in mutual funds. That mutual fund the money is invested in has a fee typically around 1%. And then oftentimes, remember with these variable annuities, you're taking that investment risk. So if the money goes down, the value of the annuity could be less than what you started with. So a lot of times um, annuities, uh, the VAs will offer what's called a living benefit rider. So the variable annuity will offer this guarantee return for a period of time. So the way these are sold typically is look, you know, you said you want to retire in 10 years, you're 55. We can invest this in, you know, we can do this rollover into this annuity. We're going to get you a guaranteed rate of return of 7% per year for the next 10 years. Sounds great on paper, but they're not quite explaining is how that fully works. Because that guarantee is on the contract value, not on your actual cash value. So even though you're getting a guaranteed basis for what the income what they use to predict the income, um, that is guaranteed, but your actual cash value is not. So if you add up all these fees, you're paying about three and a half percent per year. I've had some clients that have been as close to about 4% in fees per year that they're paying on their variable annuities. It's hard to make money when you're paying that high of fees. Yeah, it, it it certainly eats into the performance. Yeah. And again, the two things that we want to try and control are taxes and fees, because if we can keep those low, your chances for return tend to be higher. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. This is talking about an indexed annuity. So this was an actual client's return that I had um, from last year. This was an annuity that was sold prior to them becoming a client of ours. This is going back to 2019. The total return that year for the S&P 500, which is the index that was used for our client, the return for the year was 15.76%, okay? Made over 15%. What they do here is some tricky math on these indexed annuities. So this annuity says you get the S&P 500 index return, but it's capped at a monthly rate of 1%. So what this means, for example, in January, when the, when the market returned 3.2%, they're capped at just 1%. So they cap the upside. What they don't do is they don't cap the downside. So in February, when the markets were down 1.34%, now their contract is negative 0.34 return for the year. And then in month seven and eight, we had two large losses of over 10%. The rest of the year, if you add up all those 1%, they're still gonna end up negative. So the sum of the monthly rates is negative 16%. So the way the math is done here, even though the S&P 500 returned 15%, the way they set up the math, the client's return was negative 16%. So they got zero credited in a year that the index that they're supposed to be tracking got 15%. By the way, uh, Don, could you possibly go to our website? And bring it up and go to the materials page. Yep, hang on. Okay. We provide. Um, Paul, could you stop sharing for a minute? Let me share. I already screen. did. Yeah. yeah thank, you. Did. thank you. I missed that. And the only reason why we're doing this is to such so you can see what where the materials page is on our website, and our website is iyme dot org. It will get you there. Iyme dot org. Go to the materials page. And under workshops, uh, you then go below. to materials. Yeah, materials. And it's your money. And our art, uh, the Zoom is going to be right here. And see the articles. Now click on number six. I just, uh, Paul just went through 
the calculations of the numbers. But the New York Times had a, just an excellent article. Even math teachers are at a loss to understand annuities. There's very few people who can put this together and understand these variable and indexed annuities. So two points that I just wanted to make. One is go to the articles page if you want to read more on it. And two is I just wanted to show that the Times did a New York Times did an article on exactly Paul's point that these things are very difficult uh, to figure out. Paul, let's go back to your presentation. Absolutely. And um, on the flip side, I had a client last year get an index annuity um, because the one that they got had an annual, it wasn't this monthly um, shenanigans. Instead, theirs was just based on the annual return. So they were capped at like 6% per year. And so for them, they had a good exposure to the stock market. They wanted, um, it was money that they had for retirement. Um, they just didn't want to have more market exposure. They wanted guarantees on that money. So for them, that was a good way to maintain those guarantees, um, you know, guaranteed not losing any money, but still having that upside of six or 7%, which is better than like a CD is paying right now. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Yep. Go ahead and talk about mutual funds. What a mutual fund is, is they're one of the oldest forms of investments. They go back to 1940. Um, with a mutual fund, it's your money is going to be pulled together with other investors. So let's say you, you have money, you want to buy the S&P 500, the 500 largest stocks in the US. Instead of you buying all 500 stocks on your own, your money is pulled with other investments. There's going to be a portfolio fund manager that's going to choose the investments. So they're going to take the money of that pool of you and other individuals and buy a basket of the S&P 500. And then the returns are going to go to the investors minus the fee that it costs to pay for the fund manager. So this is ideally how the mutual fund works. When we talk about mutual funds, there's really um, three types that we can look at. The first is understanding the difference between stocks and bonds. Stock is literally just ownership in a company. So when a company like Coke, Apple, or Microsoft does well, you're going to make money. And when the company does bad, you're going to lose money. Stocks tend to be a more aggressive way to invest, and they can be split between domestic stocks or stocks that are here that are U.S.-based, or it could be international stocks or stocks from countries like Japan, Germany, or China. Aside from that, we have bonds. Bonds are more conservative because you're actually a creditor. So with a bond, all that is is a loan. So think of your mortgage loan where you paid a bank principal and interest each month with a bond, you're the bank, you're loaning your money out to a corporation like Apple for maybe the new iPhone product, or it could even be like the US government or a municipality to build a new school. But you're loaning your money out, so you're getting a guaranteed rate of return as they're paying you interest. And these annual, annual fees are usually, are, are, go to the investment advisor of that fund to manage that money. Correct. Yeah. If it's a Fidelity mutual fund, this is the cost that Fidelity has to pay their employees and things like that. Correct. Yeah. Uh, there's an entire, on our article, uh, indexed um, uh, financial advisors did an analysis of all of the Fidelity funds. And if you want to take a look at that, it's on their articles. We're not going to go into it, but you can certainly uh, look at our website and look for that fidelity and you can take a, a read through. It's quite interesting. Yeah, and it's interesting. shares. <laughs> yep. So mutual funds, um, you can buy, let's say you want the S&P 500 mutual fund from American funds. Well, there's like 10 different versions of it that you can buy. Each of those versions are what are called share classes. And that is how the fees are paid on that mutual fund. So if you're receiving a mutual fund that is being sold to you by a broker, so maybe you have a $25,000 account that you're rolling over and they say, hey, let's just buy these three mutual funds. There's going to be some form of commission that you're going to pay. 
Most commonly, it's going to be what's called a class A share in this case. That's typically going to be a front end fee of about 5.75%. So if you invest $100,000, there's a commission that's 5,750, which is just 5.75 times 100,000. So what you invest day one is not 100,000. You're investing $94,250 instead. That's what's actually going into the investment. And if you keep that investment for 15, 20 years and don't sell it, then the commission uh, kind of works out over that period of time. Uh, the problem is, is, is that we don't hold a lot of times mutual funds very long and these commissions eat up our investment uh, portfolio. They can, yeah, the class A share is designed for someone that's gonna typically hold an investment for five years or more. Um, there are technically still class B shares out there. I don't think anyone's selling them. If you hear class B, just run. They're the worst share class with the highest fees. Essentially it's an A share that turns into a C share. So it's gonna have the highest fees. Just avoid that if you ever hear class B. So when a person gets their statement from their brokerage firm uh, and they have purchased a mutual fund, will it state right on the, uh, uh, their monthly statement what kind of sh uh, share class they own? It should, um, okay. although I've seen in recent years not as many um, custodians are doing that. Um, they'll give you what's called the ticker of the mutual fund. So that's going to be typically a five letter thing and it's going to end in X. Um, you may have to find that ticker and you may have to uh, actually Google it. And then that'll tell you the share class. How do you find out what the fees are uh, for a mutual fund? Give us a couple of ways. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the easy two ways. One is you can go directly to the uh, mutual fund company. So let's say it's a Fidelity fund. You can go to Fidelity and just search that fund ticker and it'll pull up what's called a fund fact sheet, which will give you all that information. Um, what I think is an easier way um, would be just either going to Google, uh, just type in that, that ticker symbol and just type in the words ticker, T-I-C-K-E-R in that five letters or go to morningstar.com which is a third-party entity that screens mutual funds. And you can type in all the tickers for every mutual fund will be listed there. And they do a great job of very plainly explaining what the mutual fund is invested in, what the fees are, all that sort of information. So well, um, what, what it entails expense ratio when you, and what does that term mean? So the, yeah, the expense ratio is the actual cost that the mutual fund company uh, charges to run that mutual fund. So theoretically, that's the cost that they have to pay to keep the lights on, pay their employees. Okay, um, that expense ratio can range anywhere from, you know, zero point one five percent up to like one point two five percent. So it's a pretty wide range depending on if it's an active versus a passive mutual fund. And is it a stock versus a bond? Those are all gonna kind of dictate the expense ratio or the cost for that mutual fund. And that's an annual cost that's paid. So not a when one -time we look cost. at a mutual fund, we wanna look at the fees of that mutual fund, but you use two terms that we need to define. What is, if we say this is an active manager of this mutual fund, what do we mean by that? And if we said this other manager is a passive or index fund, what do we mean by that? So uh -huh. for an, yeah, great question. Um, for an active manager, this is gonna be someone that is trying to beat the stock market, okay? So instead of maybe just investing in the S&P 500 index, this is someone that's gonna buy maybe some stocks within the S&P 500 but they're going to try and provide for higher returns and they can adjust the portfolio based on market conditions. So if they think growth stocks are going to be better, they can put their money there. If they think, you know, the markets are going to go down, they can get out of, they can sell stock positions. 
So theoretically, they have more flexibility. With that, there's going to tend to be higher fees and lower tax efficiency because they are going to be selling the investments on a more regular basis. That'll create more taxes for the holders of the mutual fund companies. But for those, they're, what they're trying to do is create higher potential for returns. So when we doesn't always at, happen, but that's the goal. Yeah. So when we're looking at an active manager or a, a mutual fund that's actively managed, should we look at the turnover ratio for that particular um, uh, fund? And what does that mean, turnover ratio? Sure. Um, so the turnover ratio is what is used to measure how often um, they sell the stocks and buy new ones in the portfolio. For example, a turnover of, of 100% means that they typically don't hold any position. All, all stocks are sold sometime within one year. And that, what so, does that mean in practicality from a tax point, uh, point of view sure. and a fee point of view? So, with, uh, so where this is going to impact things the most is the tax efficiency. Um, we're stepping ahead a little bit here. I know you guys will be covering this in a couple of weeks, but with a higher turnover ratio, that means they're selling stocks on a more regular basis. Every time you sell a stock, you have to pay capital gains taxes on that stock. If that stock was owned for less than 12 months, then you pay that at your ordinary income tax rate, which is going to be a higher rate that could be as high as maybe 40%. Otherwise, if the stock is held for over 12 months, it's taxed at what are called long-term capital gains. And that rate can be it is at its highest point, 20%. So if you're a stockholder in that mutual fund, that affects your taxes, uh, not Correct. just the mutual funds. Correct. You want to have um, lower turnover typically because that suggests that they should be holding the stocks for a longer period of time, giving you more long-term capital gains and fewer short-term capital gains. And do mutual funds have to pay the same kind of fees that we do if we buy stocks through a Schwab or a Fidelity? I thought it was no. kind of free that they, they trade on Wall Street uh, because <laughs> of their size. Yeah, yeah, they, they, there's always that price advantage because of the size. Now, good thing is most places today, you can pick, get most stocks for free through Schwab or other places. So that's not as much of a concern today as it was even five years ago. Okay. But um, mutual funds do have to pay a fee to buy and sell stock. Of course. Okay. What is Nothing passive life is management? Free. Again, uh, passive management says you're not going to try and beat the market. You just want to get whatever the market does. So they tend to just try and get the market return. So if the S&P does 10% for the year, they're just trying to get 10% return on their portfolio. So it is going to be subject to more market fluctuations. If the market goes down, they're not going to get out of the way. So you're just going to absorb that whole loss. Um, but with that, because there's less management on the portfolio, they tend to have lower fees. There's lower turnover. So you tend to have more tax efficiency with a passive fund. Um, this is a constant debate within the industry. Um, this is going to be somewhat of a philosophical belief for each individual. So I can't tell you one's right or one's wrong. It's kind of what, what you feel is going to be best for you in your situation. And for a lot of individuals, it may be a combination of both. Yes. So Check with your good financial point. advisor and ask, are they, do they believe in active management or uh, are, do they believe in passive management as far as index funds are concerned? So passive means index, right? Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And then whether or not a fund is passive or active or their fees, is Morningstar one of the better places to go to get all that information? It is. Uh, Morningstar will give you uh, a good insight. They rate all mutual funds, but now their rating system is uh, only rated on past performance. And as we know, past performance does not guarantee future results. So while it tell you how it did in the past, it may not be the best return going forward. 
In fact, there's a study that showed 40% of the best rated Morningstar funds in five years were typically the lowest rated mutual funds. And don't um, go by, talk about a little bit about the star system uh, sure. with Morningstar because I think okay, it's yeah. So Morningstar will rate, uh, yeah, they use a rating of one through five. One being the lowest rated, five being the highest rated. You know, if you can find a mutual fund that's, you know, five stars for the last one, five, and 10 year, well, that fund historically has always performed well. So it should hopefully continue to perform well. But, but you may it, see. Is it would you, be well in that category? Yeah. So um, mutual funds uh, have different categories. So if you have, um, you know, for example, that's P500. Um, any mutual fund in that category is going to be ranked against other mutual funds that are in that S&P 500 category. You're not going to compare an S&P 500 category mutual fund with, say, a Japanese stock market fund, right? They're just different. It's apples and oranges. So all the Japanese stock market funds will be compared together. All the S&P 500 funds will be compared together. And then with each of those categories, they will be ranked from one star being the worst five star being the best based on historical performance over three, five and 10 year time horizons. Yeah, one of the things too is, is that do Morningstar rates the name of the fund, but not the fund manager, right? It's just the fund itself. Yeah, yeah. And, and every fund uh, manager will have a good year and they'll have a bad year. So, um, just when you're choosing your mutual funds, um, working with a professional, um, you know, even if you're with Vanguard and you're using their passive funds, they have a call center you can call into to get some expertise. So just work with some sort of professional, at least when you're starting out, just to have gain more understanding. How many mutual funds are there in the country? Uh, shoot. Over twenty thousand, I believe. Yeah, I think so too. Um, and and there, and some of them are commissioned, and some of them are non-commissioned. And they, what ter, what term do they use again? Oh, the load. No load. Yeah. So, yeah, no. ideally, if you're buying mutual funds on your own, you want to find funds that are called no load mutual funds. That just means that there's no commission for selling that. Um, if you're with, let's say your accounts at Fidelity, you know, Fidelity themselves will have no load funds. Schwab has no load funds. Vanguard has no load funds. Virtually every company out there at this point has some form of no load mutual funds. And that's just commission. Even, even a Merrill Lynch or a, 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 a Morgan Stanley will have no load funds. <laughs> Um, there, if you're going through Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch, uh, you're using an advisor. They're going to typically have a load. If you're buying just the mutual fund, they're going to typically sell you one of these load funds, um, because that's the, that's how the advisor gets paid. Otherwise, if they're doing a managed money account, so let's say you're paying them a 1% fee to manage your money for you, then they won't be using loaded funds. They'll be using the no load funds. Or Pete, 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 let me back us up to one thing because I've, I've always found this one to be entertaining. So I think we said there were roughly 20,000 mutual funds. Plus. Yeah. How many stocks are there? <laughs> There's less Good because point. what happens is- Less than 5,000. Yes, yeah, because yeah. the mutual and funds- On the US together, stock market, less than 5,000. Because they yeah. put together different combinations of different things. And the important part in my mind is know what it is you're buying yeah. because- there are more mutual funds than there are stocks, yeah. which means it's all these combinations and permutations of things that are out there. So it's very important to know what it is you're looking at. And most, yeah, people, and, and most, uh, go ahead. I'm gonna, most people uh, purchase load funds. Yeah, it, yeah, just try and avoid the loads. Now, there's a couple other fees involved that are legal, but not much talk about. Are you going to talk about 12B1 fees and other expenses? Um, we can. Okay. So <laughs> let's get right into it. Um, so um, 
there is what's called a 12B1 fee that can be charged by a mutual fund. Uh, it, that fee is typically anywhere from a quarter percent to about a half percent is what I've seen. Um, that 12B1 fee essentially is a marketing fee. So that's an additional fee that can be sold um, when a broker, so someone that's selling these low shares, they could sell you a mutual fund that has this front load or this back end load, if it's a class C. And on top of that, it could have what's called this 12B1 fee on, in addition to that other fee. And what are what is other expenses? Uh, sales and marketing most typically is how that's defined. Okay, so and that's an additional fee. That's an additional fee on top of, um, they tend to be more um, common in class C shares. Because class B, you're paying this upfront of 5.75. So you see that because again, you're, if you're investing 100,000, you're only investing the 94. So you see that fee day one. Class C shares, they have an, you don't charge an upfront fee. If you invest 100,000 day one with a class C, all 100,000 is going into the account. It's just, they're going to charge you an annual fee upwards of 2%. So and that two percent number could include that twelve B one fee. So it's a little bit sneakier. You don't see it or feel it as often. Yeah. So you really have to understand the fees when you're purchasing these mutual funds, um, uh, because it's all about fees. If you know if these fees are not going towards your investment, and so yeah, it, these are commissions. These aren't fees. Yeah. And. So, yeah, it's important to make that differentiation because ideally you work with a fee only financial advisor where then they're not going to be selling you these commission based products. Yeah. So a lot of times um, uh, and what happens on these as well is, is that if you are offered the prospectus, that means that you have been given full disclosure and that means that investment is suitable for you because you as a reasonably intelligent individual could have read the prospectus and there's everything you ever wanted to know in that prospectus. I looked at one, maybe this is about two, three years ago and it was from Dreyfus Fund and it had an odd share number uh, letter on it. So I, I was curious because it wasn't A, B or C. So I Googled that share and then I got to the prospectus. And in the prospectus, it said, we do not encourage you to purchase this particular share of mutual fund because the fees are higher than our average annual income. <laughs> Unless you dug into the prospectus, you would have never but found that line. And that's why the prospectus gives you all the information, but more important, you really need to understand the fees, okay? Because you, if you're gonna hold Absolutely. a mutual fund for a long period of time, these fees eat into your return. Let's go to the next slide. That is it. That is it. All right. I like that smile there, Paul. Yeah, we tried. <laughs> Uh, how about Q and A? Do we have any questions? What other kind? I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming. Okay. Uh, no, we've we've answered a couple that came along, and we've what? answered them as we've gone. So actually, we're doing good. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about. We have how much time left on? Uh, a little about fifteen minutes. Okay. What other kinds of products are sold by the financial services industry? Uh, talk a little bit about limited partnerships. Okay. Um, so there's a growing asset class known as alternative investments. And it's kind of a catch-all phrase. Um, and with that, you could get sold something called a limited partnership. Um, these were more common five or 10 years ago. Um, they're still being sold. A limited partnership is going to be essentially buying an interest 
in something, whether it's going to be real estate or a limited partnership could be maybe buying a bunch of oil wells that are producing income. But with a limited partnership, um, you're giving, there's, so with a limited partnership, there's going to be a bunch of investors. They're what are called limited partners. And then there's going to be someone that's running that business. Um, that's going to be who's the general partner. Um, the general partner um, makes a little bit more money because they have, they're the ones that are buying that. Um, the advantage with the LPs is they typically are going to be invested in things that produce income, i.e. real estate, oil and gas wells, things like that. Um, there can be some real challenges with limited partnerships, though. Um, the first one is what's called marketability. Um, I've had clients that have been invested in the same limited partnership for 15, 20 years. And it's not because they liked the investment and they wanted to keep it. In fact, they wanted to get out of it. But finding a buyer or having the opportunity to sell that limited partnership um, didn't always come through. So again, it's the important thing is not just purchasing it. Once you purchase the product, how do I get out of that product before you purchase it? Talk a little yeah. bit about, Paul, uh, investing in through. Uh, today, no one has almost a, a regular pension plan. They have a 401k. Yeah. How does an individual invest in a 401k? And uh, should they stay in their 401k after they've retired? That's an excellent question. Um, 401ks are going to be the most common way that people are going to save for retirement. Unfortunately, to retire comfortably nowadays, um, workers have to save themselves. You know, the pension, unfortunately, is a thing of yesteryear. Um, so 401ks, 403bs, 457s, depending on whether you're a public sector employee or a private sector is going to determine those numbers, whether it's a 403b or a 401k, but they're essentially the same thing. Okay, you're going to be investing that money each year. It's going to have mutual funds. Um, your company, um, by law, has to choose mutual funds with the lowest fees. So you don't have to worry about that conversation we had about load fees or things like that with your 401ks because your employer is a fiduciary and has to choose the lowest fees for them. In fact, Fidelity got sued by their own employees a few years ago because they weren't offering the lowest fees uh, in their 401k. But I see a lot of insurance companies managing small 401k programs and those fees are not low. Can you? They're, yeah. Can so you, can you as an individual, if you're in a 401k, uh, go outside of that 401k? Or do you have to participate as, uh, in other words, who's in charge of that 401k? The employee or the employer? The employer ultimately is in charge. Depending on how they set up the 401k, you may or may not be allowed to leave. Most of the time, you're not allowed to. Some larger employers, like I know Edison is a good example, will allow you to do what's called an in-service rollover, where if you, if you retain a certain age with Edison, you have to be at least age 50, and you had to have worked there for at least five years, they'll allow you to take a portion of your 401k and move it into an IRA somewhere else to help you diversify if you choose to. So if you have a small, the tech, wait, wait a second, Paul. The technical term is rollover. Is that the technical in, term? The technical term there is called an in-service rollover. Okay. By and definition, then, you typically can't move money out of a four hundred one k or four hundred three b until you no longer work for that employer. Okay, I'm retired now, and I've yep. got my four hundred one k. Do I should I roll over or should I stay with that four hundred one k? Through my, through my retirement? I would recommend working with an advisor to make that um, decision. There's a couple of things you got to consider. One is going to be the cost of moving it. There's always a cost, right? If you keep it in the 401k or the 403b, if it's held at a, an insurance company, Nationwide is a good one, a good example there. Those fees can be very high that you're paying each year to keep your money there. 
it might be in your best interest to move it out to get lower fees. You may be able to pay a professional to manage that money for you at a lower cost than you managing it yourself, leaving it in the 401k. So On the other side, you, you, yeah, you but, mentioned that a Schwab, if you roll it over to a Schwab or a Fidelity, you have more options. Is so you maybe have better diversification. Is that correct? Theoretically, yeah. And I say theoretically because it ultimately depends on the investments that you choose, right? Um, so you'll have more investment options for sure if you move out of the 401k. But if you move out of the 401k, what you're giving up is creditor protection. So if you're concerned about filing for bankruptcy, concerned about um, being sued, you get more protection um, if the money's left in the 401k umbrella than when you do move it into what's called an IRA, which is what they count you set up a Fidelity or Schwab. We get this more into the retirement planning session, but yep. however, uh, talk a little bit about 401ks. Can you, when you pass that on to your heir, can you stretch that 401k out uh, 10 years or is that limited to usually an IRA account? Uh, so it can be stretched. You still, the 10 year rule still applies on the 401k. Um, so under was under the Secure Act, which was passed last January of last year, um, when it when you pass, if your beneficiary is not your spouse, let's say if the money is going to your kids, you're the surviving spouse, uh, or maybe you're single. Um, if the money is going to an heir that is not your spouse, that account has to be um, taken out of that account within a ten year period. So ten years from your date of death, the the money has to be taken out. Good. Thank there are, you. incidentally, a couple of other exceptions. If the differential in your age is seven years or less. My wife happens to be an identical twin. She could pass it to her sister and it would retain it because their age is exactly the same. The other is, I think, if there's a special needs situation, um, they're allowed yeah. to extend some of those. So there are a couple of very there fine are. differences. But if you're having your children take it, there's more than seven years. Incidentally, let me, before we lose the opportunity, um, there's a question about large cap and small cap. I'm going to say let's defer that until yes. perhaps next week or beyond that one. We're um, going to talk about that in week four. Do you, and the, there was just a question also, uh, do you recommend investing in mutual funds indexed to your age, retirement age? So those are what are called target date funds. Those are most common in your 401k or your employer's uh, retirement plan. And those are designed to, um, the younger you are, the more aggressive they're gonna be invested. And over time, as you get closer to retirement age, they're gonna become more conservative. Um, if, you're, if you're kind of a um, hands-off sort of investor, or you wanna make minimal decision-making, they can be an excellent tool, however, you need to make sure that they make sense for you and your investment style. Um, if you're, for example, I've had 20 year olds that can't sleep if they lose a penny. And, you know, if you're a 20 year old investing in that, it's going to be the most, you know, it's going to be hundred percent stocks. It's going to be very, very aggressive. That's not going to fit their comfort level with risk. And that's not going to be a good fit. So as long as it meets, meets your risk profile, um, they can be a good way to invest for sure. One of the things that you can do now, if you if you if you have mutual funds that you don't really understand them, is make a list of the mutual funds that you own, and put next to it um, as to what is the investment objective of that fund, and that should be stated in Morningstar. That could be in the prospectus on Yahoo Finance, but you need to understand the investment objective of that fund. Another one is, is that what are the fees? What's the expense ratio of that particular mutual fund? Then is it an index or is it an active fund? And that will give you a little bit of an idea uh, of your own portfolio without making any decisions as to good, bad, or ugly. It just gives you an idea as we go through the program 
uh, when we start talking about investment objective growth, value, large cap, small cap, it will give you a better idea as to what you have. And that's kind of what our objective is. So you understand what you have and you don't want to make any changes because change is either going to have a tax impact or it is going to have a fee impact. And so when you want to make the change, you need to know what it's going to cost you to make that change. And are you going to make that change for at least for the next five years? We've got but uh, we're close to running out of time. Uh, Paul, do you have anything that you wanted to add to today's session about any kind of uh, products that are sold by the financial services industry? And if you want, Paul, you could stop sharing. Okay. Um, no, it's, it, thank, you for the, thank you for the opportunity. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. Or, or, is there any what you see as far as any products out there that's being pushed by brokerage firms today? Um, the growing thing that I'm kind of seeing are the private equity deals. Um, so a lot of private placement sort of investments. Um, they're being pitched because the big endowments like Harvard um, are investing in them. So they're being pitched as a way for to invest like the big endowments. Um, and they can be suitable for the right individual, but again, it's that, it's that annuity thing where it's not the right fit for most individuals. So you really, really got to understand what they are and how they work because there's all sorts of concerns. Is hedge funds still as popular today as it was maybe 10 years ago? Or, and what is a hedge fund, by the way? Yeah, so a hedge fund is a private investment group um, that have higher fees and the original hedge fund was designed to hedge risk uh, versus the stock market. So not be as risky. They in turn have developed all sorts of strategies. Um, they tend to be very, create high taxes and have high fees. They're still around. Most people have realized that, you know, paying the extra fees doesn't give you extra return most of the time. So they're still around, but not nearly as popular. Today, it's more the private placements I'm seeing. How about borrowing on your own investments, uh, a margin, um, I, I think they're called margin accounts? It, it's called margin uh, is one way to do it where you have stock. And so they will give you a line of credit, which is called margin based on that. So you can buy more stock. Um, I tend to not recommend. There's specific times where margin can be good. For example, let's say you need money um, to fix a house but you're refinancing it. And so you need the money now to pay your contractor, but you're going to get that money back in 60 days. Well, then doing a, a short-term loan like that might be good so that you're not creating taxes by selling investments. But outside of those kind of one-off sort of situations, you don't want to take loans out to invest money in the stock market because that tends to end badly. The biggest thing that I would say it is life insurance. We didn't discuss too much today is a great tool for legacy planning, for charitable giving, for meeting needs once you pass away. It is not an acceptable investment vehicle. And I mean, even on TikTok and social media, I'm seeing advisors pitch whole life insurance and other life insurance policies as a way to invest. It's never a good way to invest because the fees are going to be three to 4%. How about options? Options trading? Options uh, are a very aggressive strategy. Um, when you buy an options contract, it's actually 100 to 1. So you're leveraging your money. Um, so if you have experience and you're working with someone that has experience with options, they can be a good way to create additional income or hedge risk on your portfolio. But again, unless you have that expertise or a specific need, um, it's not very there's a lot of risk with it. So it's typically not the ideal way to invest. How about commodities? Pete, Pete yes. I'm, I'm going to stop you at that point. We have a couple of questions and, and we're also right at the end of our time. Uh, Paul, would you recommend that people use one advisor? Uh, there's a comment made that I have some money over here. I have some money over there. Who do I consult to on whether I should bring this all together? Um, I typically, I like simplicity in life. Life is complex enough. Your finances are complex. We want to simplify them as much as possible. Where it makes sense and where you have trust with an advisor, 
I think it makes sense to use one advisor. Otherwise, you want to have a financial planner that's not necessarily advising, that's not managing the investments, but you want a financial planner who's an independent third party to help oversee and put all the pieces together to make sure the money's working the way it should. Okay. The other is there's a comment and I, I always hate to do this and I'd never do this for Pete. People really like what you've done and think you should teach more. <laughs> so there you go. Just giving you the comment. Neither Pete, but you, that people really yeah, like yeah. today and learned a lot because you explained it very nicely yeah. and very yeah. succinctly. So yeah. I congratulate you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, Thank you. Just, as, just as a note, this was week two of It's Your Money. Next week, we actually start into the financial planning part of it. And we'll go through that for a couple of weeks and then on through to other areas. But I thank you all very much at this point, And I'm going to.